So it should come as no surprise that the removal of a large predator in any ecosystem is going to have drastic changes on the community structure. So understanding these ecological processes is really important, especially if you're trying to manage something like a fishery. And so the implementation of, sorry, excuse me, I'm all stressed about the talk not being there. Um, <laughs> it's like it's here. So um, studies cannot be conducted until you have a baseline of information for the species that you're trying to recover. So in this case, we're talking about life history. Specifically, the, li no, the life history of the giant sea bass. I'm not going to use this. So the giant sea bass, Stereolipsis gigas, is a polypronid family. They do have a wide distribution from Humboldt Bay to the Gulf of California. And they are the largest coastal teleos that we have here in California. There is a reason they call them giant sea bass. This is a big boy right here who, again, one of the um, largest ones ever recorded was actually recorded up to 2.7 meters, so almost 9 feet. So very, very large fish. These large fish are obviously targets for fisheries, including both commercial and recreational fisheries, causing their decline in the early 1930s and eventually causing them placement on the IUCN critically endangered red list. Uh, we also do know a little bit about their morphological changes from the juvenile stages to the adult stages. This is a cute little juvenile right here that looks vastly different from the larger adults. So this is where my study comes in. It's looking at the early life history phases of this critically endangered species. So I'm trying to quantify as much as I can, including the temporal and spatial distributions, the behaviors of the individuals actually in the wild, as well as estimating current and future populations using both fish surveys and um, citizen science data, because looking in the ocean for something the size of a quarter is kind of hard to do by yourself. Um, I'm also trying to determine their growth rates or morphological changes, things like planktonic larval duration and spawning periods, which again, we theorize that we know a lot about, but we actually don't know too much concrete details about. So what I did is I basically went out through 2014 to 2016 and I looked for these tiny little fish. I exclusively looked in Sandy Beach areas because that is where a lot of the recreational divers have uh, photographed them, as well as some of the literature did have reports of them being in Sandy Beach areas just past the surf zone. So this is a typical survey at Redondo Beach. This is me, this is the little fish right here, so you can get a, an idea of how big they are. <laughs> They're adorable. <laughs> and we did try to get um, not only counts of the individuals that we saw, but size measurements of them and the other species just, um, that were abundant as well. So what we found is not only found this orange one that is usually common, common, uh, but we also found two other color morphs. So we did find this very tiny little black morph. Imagine the size of a dime, like put a fish in the dime. That's how big this little black one is. So um, they are very round. They do have these dark spots all over their body, and they do have this, e -long, or this enlarged pelvic fin. I do believe that it's kind of used as like a stability because they are in these surf zones that can be very turbid. So they kind of use it as a sail and a keel to kind of stabilize themselves. At least that's what I believe. Did not test that. <laughs> uh, we did find a very patchy distribution, which is interesting. We only found them July through February. What you can see here is this is a average abundance across the, uh, over time. So July through February. And we do have a peak in, again, the early summer months, to the early fall months. We did only exclusively find them in Sandy Beach areas, not a shock, because that's where we were only looking. Um, but we did find them again in shallow waters, which confirms the previous literature. Uh, we did only find them by themselves, although some of the citizen science data that we collected did have reports of small schools of individuals, but we only saw them by themselves. Most notably what we found was this patchy distribution seemed to correlate with the heads of underwater canyons. So only where you have this, this is a uh, map of Southern California from Malibu to La Jolla, this is a depth contour line, and where these deep water canyons are meeting these shallow beach areas is almost exclusively where you're finding these individuals, which is something that we did not know before. Um, kind of pretty interesting, I think. Uh, so when we tested this, yes, we did determine that all these sites that had underwater canyons, or at least underwater canyon adjacent, did have a statistically significant um, difference between all the zero sites. I did not include all the zero sites because they were zero. Um, but I do want to point out that they are all the same except Hermosa, which is, has a small fingerling of an underwater canyon that kind of leads out to it. And La Jolla is way lower than it should be because I did not include the citizen science data in this analysis. So what you can see is the distribution away from the canyon, starting at zero here and moving all the way to 2,100 meters, is you have this sharp decrease in the population. So you really, again, only find them at the very heads of underwater canyons with a very distinct decrease after that. 
I would like to point out that these little blips right here are again, those kind of branches off of the canyon. So they're kind of canyon adjacent, which is why you still find them there. Another thing we were able to do is because we did record all of these uh, transects that we did, we were able to categorize some of the typical behaviors that they undergo, specifically the top three I'm gonna show you guys examples of, starting with cruising and cruising. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's not going off. Sorry. My apologies. Anyway, so when they're cruising, if they're doing just that's awful. That's okay. Um, so they are cruising. They basically just cruise around just over the soft sandy bottom. Um, they do extend their pelvic fins um, in and out. I believe that again is kind of like a sail and a keel to kind of stabilize themselves in these highly turbid areas, as well as they do sometimes drag it along the bottom. And I believe that that's so they can kind of have spatial awareness of where the bottom is so that when a big surge comes in, they don't smash up against the sand and injure themselves. I hope this doesn't do this again. term that I have deemed because you know, they actually try to resemble kelp. So, oh, this is gone. It's okay, I'm loud. So what they do is they will actually, so their bright, that bright orange coloration is actually mimicked in these areas because they are so green, they really don't look that bright. But what they do look like is a little piece of macrocystis. So you can see the macrocystis right there, and as the surge comes in and out, the fish will actually turn into it and kind of flop just like kelp, which is why I've determined this behavior kelping. So it's like they're hiding, but in plain sight. Because in these sandy beach areas, there's not a lot of structure, there's not a lot of anything, so this allows them to blend into an area with very few predators, really successful. And I've actually had numerous divers swim right over these little guys while they're kelping, and they didn't even know it. Uh, another behavior is called sitting. No, of course, they're not actually sitting. But what they do do is they kind of hang out in these tiny little rivets, and they will basically just sit there and just kind of like wiggle back and forth as the surge comes in and out possibly to avoid the surge, possibly again to avoid detection by predators. Uh, that little dart right there, that is foraging, so at all times they are foraging. So when we calculate the total abundances of these individuals, either sitting, cruising, or kelping, which you can see right here with the behaviors on the X and the total abundances on the Y, is that most of the time these individuals are kelping, which is pretty interesting. But when you break it down by size class, what you should see is all three size classes, small, medium, and large, should have the same relative abundance of behaviors, but they don't. So we tested this with a test of homogeneity, and we saw that, yes, these kelping behaviors are really mostly done by the adults. Maybe it's because the adults are orange, the kelp is orange. Maybe it's because they're more physically developed and therefore more able to actually kelp and not be blown all over the place by the surge. What, Larry? Not as big as their big ones. Well, yes, okay, of course they're not adults. When I say big, I mean like two inches big. <laughs> big, big. All right, um, so yes, we did determine that they are statistically different. Um, foraging, like I said, they do forage pretty much all the time, so I didn't include this in the analysis because they're doing it all the time, no matter what. Whether they're sitting, cruising, or kelping, they are foraging. These are little mices right here. You can see they're very, very abundant in these areas. We were able to um, confirm this through gut content analysis. So this is one of the individuals that we pulled out of this guy, and some of the larger individuals that we had, one of them actually had a small squid in his belly. So we do know that they start out eating these crustaceans and then move on to these uh, cephalopods later. A couple of unique predator avoidance behaviors that they do. This is an individual who is helping, and when approached by either a diver or, in this case, a small lizardfish, a juvenile lizardfish is approaching him, what they will do is when they spot the predator, they will kind of turn and just drift away. So almost like they're trying to, they didn't see me, I'm just gonna walk away. So they don't, again, dart away, they basically just do this slow drifting away as if they were still a detached piece of kelp. <laughs> uh, another unique behavior that we did work, we were able to categorize was this bearing behavior. So in one instance, a diver actually startled the fish. He turned sideways, undulated like a flatfish, and completely buried himself in the sediment. Possibly another reason they like these sandy beach areas, because they're able to do that, we don't exactly know. So this is the buried fish right here, and this is an insert of their scale. So you can see that it is completely submerged in the sediment. 
And we were able to publish this last year. Uh, the next stage was we moved on to the otolith analysis part to determine growth rates. We did collect 30 individuals who were sacrificed in the most humane way I could possibly think of. <laughs> Sad when you look for a year to find these guys and you have to kill them. So we looked at weights, morphometrics, we took pictures of them um, to document their spots for spot pattern analysis later. And then we actually image, uh, we used ImageJ to analyze the images. So it basically came out like this which looks a little messy, so I'm gonna zoom in right here, and what you can see is these peaks and these valleys represent the bars. So each of the rings of the otolith, you can count by either counting the peaks or the valleys. And we are able to confirm this by looking, again, directly at the image to count and comparing it to what we see in the image J analysis. So what we found was another really exciting bar graph. Uh, <laughs> and what we see here is the planktonic larval duration is actually closer to 20 days. It is theorized that it was 30 to 60, we didn't really know, and now we actually have some proof that it is around more like 20 days. This again can allow us to back calculate the two spawning periods. So we know they spawn in the summer months, we don't exactly know when, but this can allow us basically, we see some uh, little black morphs in July, which means they're spawning in July, we also see some little black morphs as late as November, which means that they're spawning as late as October, which again was not really believed, it was believed that it was just the summer months. I do have to mention that this was during two El Nino years, so this might be different in non-El Nino years because the water temperatures were much warmer during those years. It was great. Uh, so we are in the process of completing the growth curve. Finally, once we finish all these otolith analysis, we will finally have a full, complete life history growth curve for them. And we're also able to compare these growth rates in the field with growth rates in the lab. So unfortunately, my fish was not on display yesterday at the Monterey Aquarium, but they do have one. They've been growing it for over a year, and we are able to compare their growth rates and morphology to our growth rates, which we see in the lab. So we have finally created a baseline of information on this critically endangered and highly understudied species, determining their habitat, which is these sandy beach areas adjacent to underwater canyons during these summer fall months. We recorded their behaviors and categorized them. We confirmed their diet, the planktonic larval duration, and now we're in the process of creating a growth curve. So we're finally getting some serious information based on this endangered species. So I'd like to thank all my funding and everybody who came diving with me, and I will take any questions.